have a nice little convergence with like what really separates Greek mythology from Roman mythology in the Scylla and Charybdis stuff. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because I'm pretty sure we start off with a different Greek myth. So um, where we left off, they had just escaped the Andromeda. And in this chapter, we have them, um, we have them, they wash up on shore, right? First, it was like in the Virginia Bay or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, once they do, they encounter a Hydra. And so for Hydras, I mean, it's really self-explanatory. I feel like that's one of the myths that people most know from Hercules. Um, the idea that it is a nine-headed, like, dragon-type thing. And... Um, Eight of the heads are mortal, one is immortal, which, um, like, well, we'll get to that part later. Um, so Hercules discovers that you can't cut off one of their heads because the moment you do, two other heads will regenerate from the wound. And he learns that you have to cauterize him as you're going. And um, so he has a helper when he does it that helps him figure this out and do it. Um, once they get to the ninth head, which happens to be the immortal one, they bury that one under a large rock, I believe. So, um, I don't think that had actually died. It's kind of ambiguous. <laughs> um, but I also have my D and D monster manual in front of me. So I thought that this could be a better idea of what kind of monster they're up against because the Greek mythology doesn't give a ton of details. Um, I mean, like I said, we all know the facts that heads grow back from more heads grow back than were cut off. Mm -hmm. And um, the poison, uh, that aspect, which like the poison is so potent when you think about it that, um, what's her name, Dinera. I don't remember her name, right? Hercules' wife is able to hold on to a cloak that is dipped in hydra blood and it's still poisonous even after she washes it out. So it's it's that poisonous by contact. And um, the other kind of like proof that we have in Greek mythology of how poisonous these arrows are is that um, po or, uh, Philoctetes, when he is stuck on that island by himself, they don't talk about him having other bow and arrows than the one that he took from Hercules. So he was reusing those Hydra blood dipped arrows. So I have to imagine the poison is quite potent if they can go through countless squirrels or whatever the hell he was <laughs> hunting on the island and still be poison en poisonous enough to affect Paris. Paris didn't die immediately, but he did succumb to the poison eventually. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so they didn't stand much of a chance. And I think it was very realistic that this was not a monster that they fought. This was a monster they escaped. Yeah. Yeah, if Clarice hadn't come when she did, which you know that like after what just happened with Luke, they're like, well, like, yes. <laughs> yeah. One thing with Hydra that I think is weird is that Hydra is something in the Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. um, Hydra is their villainous like organization that is like hidden inside S.H.I.E.L.D. the entire time. Yeah. And there are a lot of fan fictions about that, <laughs> about them meeting people, the Avengers, and the Avengers thinking that they're in Hydra and them being like the monster Hydra or them making fun of Hydra because it's not an actual Hydra. Yeah. But it also makes me wonder if that's where that idea came from. Like if that's way back in the day, did they use the Hydra myth as, it's like the, the like thing for Hydra in the Marvel movies is like a skull with a bunch of like octopus arms. So it's not exactly an actual Hydra, but I guess it's close enough. <laughs> Yeah, the other instance where, like, a work of fiction has randomly taken Hydra was Prison Break. And I don't remember much about this because I I've only I only know about Prison Break through osmosis. Like, I have seen Jake watching it. And so I haven't seen every episode. I've seen enough to know the basic plot. 
And Hydra, I think, has six leaders, and that's how they want. Or no, Scylla. They have a Scylla. They don't have a Hydra. My bad. I jumped ahead of myself. Um, but yeah, it's the idea that it could be named after the Hydra. I guess the idea is that it's incredibly hard to beat. That like the moment you take out maybe a leader or a faction of it, there's just going to be more that spring up in their place. Unless you have fire, yeah, it would be hard to beat. I mean, I'm sure one of the Avengers has fire powers. They at least have weapons. Like, yeah. Percy Jackson has no weapons. They don't have guns or bombs or they have a little bit of that towards the very end of these books. But most of the time they don't do any of that stuff. And so it's not like they would be walking around with weapons like that to use. <laughs> but yeah. the Avengers, absolutely, they, they definitely would do that. <laughs> Yeah, well, we know that these kids are like resting on basically their demigod ADHD at this point. They're just dodging the poison. Um, and whatever weapons they have, I mean, Hermes did the packing for them. So they couldn't have brought more than they normally do. I mean, Hermes probably would have thought to pack like Annabeth's knife and um, Riptide is always kind of tied to Percy. So it's not like he could go without it. Um, Tyson doesn't really have a known weapon, I guess, or a weapon of choice at this point. But we do know that he packed his little trinkets. Um, so, I mean, they were very ill-equipped for this battle. And unless they had some sort of flamethrower, they were not going to make it. <laughs> Yeah, and well, I feel like it would have been a very annoying battle is the best part I can think about it because Percy heals himself with water. And so they're right next to water. And so anytime a Hydra ever hurt him, he would just jump in the water and he would be fine. And yeah. so it would it would probably get pissed off at him that it, he wouldn't actually die. And it, other than like making sure that Annabeth doesn't get hit by anything, it's just like it would just keep going over and over and over and over again <laughs> until they figured out a way to find something that's that has fire on it. Um, it I feel like the Hydra would have like given up at some point as well. <laughs> yeah, it's been like, why won't this child die? <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. So I'm glad they escaped that battle because. It, like, okay, so the Hydra in the D&D monster book um, got a decent amount of natural armor and a pretty big amount of strength and constitution. So that means it's very strong. It has a lot of health, so it would be hard to take down. And yeah, the amount of natural armor means you have to roll pretty high to hit it. Um, yeah, so... They, they needed more equipment than they came with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, as far as the weapons that we see the kids using in camp and stuff, there really wasn't anything that they they could have brought with them either that now that I think about it, that would have been effective enough. Probably not. Yeah, so then we have Clarice come up, which we've talked about this a little bit here and there because in um, Sea of Monsters, Clarice is on a Confederate ship and Dior is a POC. So that just automatically feels like, how are they gonna reconcile this? Um, but if they reconciled it any other way, I don't know that it would work as well for the story because I mean, so I got a little intel from my brother on Confederate ships because um, he it's one of his special interests, you know, United States history, war history. And so um, the ships were wooden, but they had like iron pieces above the surface of the water. Um, and they had cannons, but the cannons weren't really even powerful enough for the ships to take out each other. And so it was, it was not very effective navally in that way. Um, and so if we were to go with some other ships from some other, you know, like lost war, um, my brother's first thought was World War II, but that's already too tied into the Percy Jackson lore. 
for them to bring it in that way. And he also mentioned that the ships by World War II era might have been able to handle Charybdis better. Well, and, and it also has to be like American, um, I think. Like, I think the reason why he did that, what he did with it being Confederate ones is because this was an American ship that could just be there um, where they were leaving in New York. And so I can't think of another I mean, there's other battles, I suppose. Like, you could go back to, like, the Revolutionary War and make them British. <laughs> yeah. um, but other than somehow turning the whole Confederate soldier thing on its head and, like, making them be their little bitches or something, um, I don't know. Unless they just completely change how, if they can talk. Like, they could just make it where they can't talk or communicate with them because, <laughs> I mean, there's one line in these chapters that's like, oh, they like Annabeth because she's from Virginia. And I'm like, well, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what they're going to do with that because they don't like Percy because he's from the North. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah. not going to like Annabeth or Clarice. And so maybe they're just going to make them like undead things that can't speak or can't talk or something like that. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, they're going to have to fiddle with that for sure. But I mean, I do think that... You know, like you said, if they make them very subservient, like they have to obey Clarice and maybe they're a little bit salty about it, but we can get some comedy about it. I feel like they can make that work. Um, I mean, the other Confederate thing that's co more contemporary is Twilight, <laughs> like, you know, where they have Jasper as the ex-Confederate leader and they just never happen to mention that, it, like, other than to say, oh, he has a military background. Yep, like, yep, I used to, I used to really hate black people. Um, <laughs> there's no, there's none of those people in, in this anyway, because this was based on Mormons. Um, but it's just there and you're just like, anyway, moving on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it's like, no, let's address this. Did you join because of where you lived and it was the thing to do? Did you join because there was pressure? Like, there could have been ways to write it and still have it work of like, oh, he joined because there was immense pressure around him around men his age. And then he he left the army and joins the vampires or whatever the heck, you know? They could have somehow worked it in, in a way where he could have been a Confederate leader and still been sympathetic for that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm thinking if they make these soldiers ones that like, maybe they're salty about it, but maybe they're also salty about choosing the wrong side. Maybe we put wrong side jokes in there. <laughs> um, but then again, that also, I don't know, does Rick care about alienating that kind of audience? I don't think so. No. <laughs> like, he, I don't think it's possible for Rick Riordan to care less if racists are angry at him. Yeah, but I don't know that, I mean, does everybody that has the Confederate flag necessarily think of it as a racism thing, though? Because I feel like there's some that try to pretend it's a Southern heritage thing and that for them That's it's not connected. Them gaslighting themselves, but... They say that it's not a racist thing while also giving excuses about why they can stomp black people wherever they want to. So it's like they just don't want to have to admit that they're showing a flag and that Southern pride is somehow connected to the idea that black people should be your slaves. I don't know how else to put that, that you could think that Southern pride, that's not a good thing to admit about yourself, that you see that as prideful, that you're proud of something like that. Um, you should be ashamed. <laughs> and so it's, yeah, he doesn't care about that. I think honestly, most of the show decisions would probably go along with like, what do we, we don't want to make our actors uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to make the audience who is watching this, who love these actors because they look like them. Finally, we don't want to make them uncomfortable either. Like everything. Rick Riordan does is very much thinking about like kids who love him and how they, how they would feel about him. And so whatever they decide to do with this, I think that's going to be the motivations of how they figure it out. I don't think he gives even like a quarter of a fuck about how like Southern pride racist people. 
any hateful people at all would care about like what he what they think about him um maybe disney might yeah like they can art they would have argued about that before they even start filming so those arguments have already happened (laughs) i'm sure that some of that happened but disney has like has gone along with whatever he wanted for season one like one of the things i thought was funny that article that i found about them talking about medusa and that they wanted to bring in like the power differentials and take away like the the like misogynistic parts of that story and bring in the more like fem like feminist side of the story and when they initially talked about that episode with disney executives disney was like oh is this an episode where he's gonna learn to like his dad more and rick was no no the opposite (laughs) the actual he's the opposite and so they obviously went along with whatever he said um so that would probably be the hardest part was to get disney on board with whatever they decide to do because you know of how conservative of a company disney is in general but i also think that they have some leeway when it comes to that because of how successful they've been so far (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if they take the risk. I mean, Dior hasn't said anything about the Confederate part specifically, but she did say she was excited about filming the boat scenes. Yeah, so. she gets to she that whole sequence. I, the whole time that that sequence was going on, I like every time I read anything right now, I'm thinking about what is this going to look like on the show. But especially that entire sequence, I was like, how are they going to film any of this? Like. I was like picturing how they're going to do it because it's such like a huge thing, like a huge sequence, tons of physical things happening, like crazy things happening. Like that's definitely something that's going to probably have to be filmed on like their stage, like where they filmed the Tunnel of Love stuff, just like redone. Because I don't know how they could film them like going around in a circle, being eaten by a giant mouth. Um, And then Percy like, flinging getting flung a like hundred feet into the air and crashing into and crashing into the ocean and only surviving that because he's a Poseidon child um in the way that he does besides all the other stuff that's going on in that scene without it being something like that without yeah that's gonna be wild it's gonna be it would be really fun for her to film because she's bossing everybody around yeah and she's the one in charge until the ship blows up but yeah. that's definitely fun stuff for her to do. Well, and I'm curious how that scene's going to look with Dior because she's done the intimidating scenes. She's done the the scenes where she is in Percy's face bullying him. And this one, we got a little bit more playful. We have her being like, well, I don't know if you're prisoners or not yet. So um, I guess you can stay. And uh you know, her being a little bit boastful that she has picked them up, that she has helped them out. Um, and I mean, there's there's the allusions to the um, the oracle she got, of course, which seems to mention Percy. I forgot what it was because it's been so long since I read this, but. Um, yeah, I generally yeah. don't remember, but she is there by herself. Mm-hmm. Um, and usually quests involve three people. Yeah. So it's pretty obvious that the Oracle said something about how Annabeth and Percy are the other people that are likely supposed to be part of her quest. And that at some point, Percy is supposed to be the one to take the Golden Fleece and do, or at least find it. Um, Because that is what I remember. Like, he does find it, but he gives it to her. Um, When we get to like the end that she she's the one that has it. And so it's definitely like a teamwork sort of thing that they have going on there. Um, I'm just thinking of how interesting it will be to see them on screen um, play this stuff out because, I don't know, just the whole her showing up and being like, oh, camp kicked you out for all of time. And it's like, oh, that's nice. Uh, That's one of those things that I think about when it comes to this book is that the only reason they get back into camp at all is because they find Chiron. And or they're able to reinstate Chiron. And the way that that happens is very un severely unplanned, like could not be more unplanned if it was humanly possible to be unplanned. And so there's no way that they could have known that that was going to work out that way. 
Mm -hmm. So I was just always thinking, like, what if they didn't do that? Like, what if that didn't happen? They would have got back to camp and they would have kept them being kicked out of camp. Yeah. That's what would have happened. And I'm just like, this, this, every quest is a little bit chaotic, but like this quest is so fucking chaotic and it's not their fault. It's because of all the other people around them. Like, it's absolutely ridiculous that what, how they started off on their quest was Hermes lying to them mm -hmm. and Clarice leaves with by herself and she knows that this obviously isn't right that like she doesn't want to take anybody with her because they have to protect camp yeah and it's like she can't take two other people with her even if she wanted to because what is camp going to do without three Aries kids to help them out and then on top of that, it's like, it's very obvious that Tantalus and stuff d doesn't give a fuck about what's going to happen to her. <laughs> and so it's like, everything is super chaotic and wild. And it's not either one of their faults. They're just trying to figure it out. And it's like, this is ridiculous that all these adults are just making really stupid decisions, <laughs> like yeah. in a way that doesn't necessarily happen the same way with other quests where they're, they're just trying to like keep up and it's not their it's genuinely not their fault at all and i'm just like this is absurd like how many things these kids are having to deal with just trying to this is such an easy quest like save camp why is everyone making this so hard for them yeah and poor chiron by the way since we mentioned him is stuck with all the other centaurs who are partying it up which I mean, I've said this before that like Chiron is supposed to be the not like other centaurs centaur. I mean, he's exceptional for not being like that. He's with the party ponies. And yeah. one thing I liked about that is that he, I liked the fact that he was mad at Annabeth for letting Percy leave camp. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy any father figures that want to actually protect him from harm instead of directly pushing him into it and then leaving him there. Um, so that's a nice, that's nice. I, he even doesn't do things like that in other books, but I appreciate it right now that he's consistent in being like, what are you doing? Percy should be at camp. Why is he out in the wild where Luke could like kill him? What are you doing? You're supposed to protect him. And she's just like, anyway, <laughs> he basically just has to move on from that because it's like, well, it's already happened. So what am I going to say about that? But I still appreciate the fact that he is like you didn't listen to me child you're supposed to keep him places where he won't get murdered i mean that's not camp right now either but <laughs> but that's still what he said um i yeah i i just like the fact that in this book chiron is such a little dad to both of them of being like i want to protect you i want you to be both of you to be safe and you're absolutely very unsafe right now and i don't approve of this <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, he's actually the leader that everyone wishes Dumbledore was. <laughs> yes, he does way more. Honestly, Chiron in the first book does more. Even the things that he does, there are definitely things he does that I don't like in later books. But I could even argue that him hiding the whole end part of the prophecy from Percy is him trying to do this general thing of like you are right and the way when he tells percy that in the last book he says like you have so many things on your shoulders right now that you're carrying already we didn't want to like burden you with something else mm -hmm. it's not a thing of like i don't want to tell you so that you will kill yourself at the right time and i'm just like fattening you up for that in the way that dumbledore does he legitimately just doesn't want percy to have to deal with any more than he already is and I'm like, I can at least understand that because that's nice of you to try to do. <laughs> that's very nice of you to try to take something off of his plate when he has everything else. And he's one of the only people that actually even thinks about him like that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in, in Harry's case, I guess, is the implication there that if he would have known earlier, he would have been more reckless or would have killed himself? I'm, I'm I honestly don't know it. That whole thing with Dumbledore reminds me a lot of just like abusive dynamics, like the idea of like 
I'm not even going to give you the chance to tell me no. Mm -hmm. Um, even though like, would, would Harry have said no? No, probably not. Like, but they don't even offer him the choice of deciding. It's just, this is just what he has to do. And it's like this weird idea, like imagining that a kid would like abandon everyone that he knows in this world, just if you tell him and let him know what he's supposed to do longer than five minutes before he has to do it. It's like, I don't think that he would have been like, I don't want to do this. Goodbye. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> I can't imagine Harry ever doing something like that at any point anyway. And so I generally don't know, besides just Dumbledore being a control freak and wanting absolute control. Like if you're going to compare Dumbledore to anybody in like Percy Jackson, I would compare him more to Zeus than anyone else because Zeus just wants total control of everyone. Yeah. Um, and does whatever he wants. Like Dumbledore acts like he's nicer. He puts on like a nice face and is able to do that in the way that Zeus doesn't feel like he has to. And so he doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's very much the same thing of, I just want total control of everything. And if I don't, and I don't have to tell this child that he has a Horcrux on his forehead. So why would I do that? If I don't have to tell him, I can just get away with not doing it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think, well, so, okay. So I'm just trying to follow the logic here because this made my brain go on a little rabbit hole. So, um, the idea with Harry being a horcrux, because I know that J.K. Rowling's also hesitant to call him a proper horcrux. He's a mistaken semi-horcrux. Um, so with the idea being that he needs to die in order to get rid of that piece of Voldemort's soul, like, is there a danger of him knowing too soon, him thinking like, well, I'm going to die, I guess this is fine? Um, sure, but I don't see Harry being that type of hero because Harry is the type who would be like, did we get all of the horror crooks as possible that I need to be here for? And, uh, then going off and doing what he needs to do. Yeah, I don't yeah. think he would have left the horror crooks for everybody else. Out of the, out of these two heroes, like Percy and, Har and Harry, if there was one that was going to just kill themselves... To make everyone's life easier it's percy mm -hmm. like not harry percy would have done that like if the roles were reversed in that way where percy had to die in order for everyone to be saved he would have just done it as soon as he heard about it and just got everything over with um harry isn't quite like that for whatever reason um that's not he's not quite as self-sacrificing in that way because he's written by an asshole that doesn't know how to write abused characters so he doesn't act like somebody who actually is but but percy is <laughs> so like that yeah if any woman was gonna do that like that it would be percy <laughs> yeah percy's the first one to be like everybody else could do this job better than me and harry's not it's, it's like a humility thing. Yeah, like, it's kind of, I mean, to compare, like, the first quest they ever go on, mm -hmm. um, like, the whole, the chess game, and then the other quest that they cut out in the movies, the um, potion one, I think? Yeah, it was like a potion, um, a potion, what do you call it, like, puzzle kind of thing. Yeah. But either way, in Harry Potter, like one friend gets taken out in the chess game, the other friend gets taken out in the potion thing, and then he is the one left at the end. That would never happen in Percy Jackson. Mm -hmm. That would never, never. Percy would start himself on fire before he would let both of his friends sacrifice themselves for his benefit. Instead, he flings himself off of the off of the arch. After he's known and he's known Annabeth by that point for three days, mm -hmm. at, at the most three days, and for the two weeks before that, she basically just stalked him, and he thought that she was a bully. Mm -hmm. And besides that, anyway, when he he realizes that she likes him, two days later he 
flings himself off of a St. Louis arch to save her life. Like that's, that's where his priorities are. <laughs> yeah. If he would, that never would have happened. And it, that's like those little, those little things with Harry Potter that I'm just like, yeah, I can tell who wrote this and that you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and it bothers me that you don't because your main character deserved a lot better than he got, but I can't help that because you're the one who wrote him this way. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm trying to think before we run into the next monsters. The next thing that we could talk about is probably the message from Aries or the message with Aries. I forgot that it happened with smoke every time that you've talked about it prior to this. But that he's basically like steam um so it's some sort of virus message mm -hmm. and she's still intimidated and he's still scary and even even percy is like i'm feeling a presence that feels very familiar and i'm angry all of a sudden <laughs> yeah that scene was very upsetting for me to read i think that it's funny that I forgot about that scene until I saw a video about it a couple months ago on here. And it was like, oh, okay. Because he like holds his fist up, fist up like he's going to hit her. And it's another one of those scenes where I'm like, did Rick Riordan meet my dad? Like, did he, should I like ask him this just to be sure that he didn't base this character on him? Cause it's very, very much like that. Um, especially the line he says about, like, I should have had one of my sons do this. My dad very much wanted me to be a boy. Ugh, yeah. Um, that's why I'm very not feminine at all. Um, like, I've never worn, I don't know how to do makeup at all. I don't know how to do any of those things. I've had the same hair my entire life. I've never even dyed my hair before. Do I want to? Yeah, that would be I think that would be fun. I even know like what I would if in a magical world where I had money to do stuff like that and I could do that, I would do it. Um, and I know what I would do, but yeah, I'm, st I'm to this day, I'm terrified of wearing the clothes that I actually would like to wear, which is like dresses. I'm a actively terrified of wearing them um, because he didn't want me to be feminine at all. And I'm not. <laughs> and I think that it's funny that my sister is very feminine, um, but I'm not at all. And which always confused people when we were growing up. They thought that my sister was my stepsister because of how much we were not alike at all. Um, so yeah, I, I, it makes sense to me that Aries would be like that, that he would be disappointed with having a daughter as opposed to a son and would think that she would um, fail on this quest. Like the only reason she's going to fail on this quest is because the people at camp gave her no absolutely nothing to work with. And also Ares didn't, like from what you said about the ship that she has, he basically gave her the worst possible ship for her to use. Mm -hmm. If you're going out into the middle of the ocean, why would you give her a ship that's not meant to be in the middle of the ocean? Yeah. If you actually want her to succeed, that doesn't make any sense. Um, the thing about that, that's like one of those, that scene of Ares, is one of those things that like it sounds weird but the number one like change i hope to happen in the show is for is for annabeth to somehow hear that too purely so that she can look at percy's reaction to it and realize that gabe was worse than she probably realizes at this point because i just want someone else to know how bad gabe actually was because mm -hmm. percy's not going to tell anybody a single fucking thing we're not going to do that <laughs> And I, I was thinking about this the other day, but um, one thing that's kind of weird is that when you're in a place that you're not normally in, like camp or something like that, in this way, it's easier to pretend like there isn't a horribly abusive person at home ruining your life. You can like almost cosplay as being a normal person um, and just never talk about that person. He's at camp, he's at camp and he's dealing with camp things people aren't going to ask him about his abusive ass stepfather. They're, they're not going to ask about his stepfather. They might ask about his mom, but even his mom, they might not ask about. And so he can, he's never going to tell anybody about how Gabe really was, especially now that he's gone. Um, 
it would have to be something like this. So it's like, this is like the one chance I feel like on screen anyway, we could see like Annabeth realizing it. Like, I don't even know if she, I want her to even bring it up with him because that's usually not a good idea. Um, like the one, the thing that I, I really liked about that scene was how Percy reacted because that's how we react. Um, is that he doesn't, like when Annabeth asks him what's wrong, he doesn't even talk. <laughs> yeah, you would like not want to talk after that. But he also doesn't look at Clarice and doesn't like, doesn't want to look at her and doesn't bring it up with her because yeah, you don't want to do that. It usually, and I, it's just, it's a hard situation when you're a kid mm -hmm. because this definitely happened. Like there were kids that I knew that I'm pretty sure I've talked about on here before, but I can't remember that I recognized that they were going through the same thing as me when I was in middle school and high school. And I didn't say anything to them because it's like, you're a kid, you can't do anything about it. And so saying it out loud somehow makes it worse to like admit that what's going on with both of you and having it out there in like the open. But I do remember that those people that I knew that was happening with, I used to just like watch them sometimes at school to try to figure out how they were. Because you care about that person because you know what they're going through, even if you can't really talk about it. And I do remember some of those kids that I was in school with, there were times when I would like look at them and see them just looking at me. And it was them doing the same thing with me, just like looking at me and being like, are you okay? And me looking at them and being like, are you okay? <laughs> and, but that's like all you can really do in that sort of situation. And so Percy not even wanting to look at Clarice because he doesn't want to bring it up. It's never a good idea to bring it up. Um, we would just get angry and deny it if you did bring it up. That was like an accurate response to how somebody who experienced this would actually respond which was nice because a lot of times in stories like this they kind of have like the full house you know moment mm -hmm. or gi joe moment if i'm i'm being really old school by talking about gi joe but <laughs> but so you get my point is that they'll have like they'll play like the soft music and they'll be like are you okay i can oh. save you from your abusive dad it's like no i can't no i yeah. can't and like, thank God this universe is based in actual reality, which is that no, you can't do shit. <laughs> like you can't save, especially if you're another child, you're not going to save anyone from anything. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad that they don't even try to like put that on anybody in any of these stories. They don't act like they can save Clarice from her extremely abusive dad that also can't die and is immortal and is angry just base level <laughs> yeah like, these weird random scenes we have with harry interacting with draco where harry's trying to be nice to him or he's trying to save him and stuff i like the room of requirement one in the last book comes to mind where he saves him and crab and goyle from the flaming you know room of requirement like theoretically does it sound too horrible to let your worst enemy at school burn and burn alive Yes, theoretically, but we didn't establish an emotional relationship between Harry and Draco where Harry saving Draco makes sense. In, in this one, this is establishing something between Percy and Clarice where we see that he sees there's a different side to her and he doesn't even need to mention to it, it to her. He's just going to catalog it in his brain of, oh, this is why she's that way. Okay. I can understand that now. It's the thing too of like, they have the characterization set up already for Aries. Mm -hmm. And so having him be someone who would be willing, who would treat his kids like that is not surprising. Mm -hmm. He's already on the show at least, I can't remember if he says this stuff in the books, but I'm pretty sure he does, where he says that he hates his own children mm -hmm. and that he hates the, sum the winter solstice day because it's the only day of the year he has to actually see his children. Like he literally cannot stand the fact that his children exist. And so somebody like him treating their kids like that, that's just a rational sort of thing to expect almost from how they show his characterization. And even Clarice in the books and definitely on the show, she has reasons to be mad at 
Percy, but they never treat her like Draco. Like, there's always a little bit of, like, humanity behind her. Like, the worst things about Clarice, at least the show version in the first season, is Luke lying about her. <laughs> That's the worst thing about her in season one, is that you think that she is working with with Kronos when she's not, she's not, she's not, she's not. She's just, when you take that away, it's like, okay, she just doesn't like Percy because he because she feels threatened by him because of how good he is at beating the Minotaur the first time when he was a t tiny little child. That's like, whatever, fine. After that, she's just like another person annoyed by him that he can deal with. And it's much more like even, mm -hmm. you know, like even in these scenes, he's like, oh, did nobody want to go on the quest with you? Yeah. And it it's like, the, it's very even like going back and forth at each other. It's not like one person bullying the other one anymore. Um, because now she is, now we realize that she's not a horrible person. Luke is, that she never actually was. She was just angry at Percy, and you can understand why, since Ares is her stupid-ass father. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that makes a huge difference for how you show her, to show her as a human, like a, a, like somebody who's not just like an angry stereotype of an angry British person. That's... Mm -hmm. I don't even know. Like Draco never even gets to the point really in the books where he even, I'm not even sure that he even realizes like that he did anything wrong necessarily or anything by the end of the books. It's really weird. Like people compare him sometimes to like Zuko. I don't even think he got that far. <laughs> I don't think he, he even got that far. Point. If anything, Dudley comes closer because Dudley at least acknowledges and says, I don't think that your existence is bad, you know, like, uh, but Draco, I mean, I'm pretty sure the ending we get from him, everything after or before the prologue or epilogue, sorry, everything before the epilogue is just him and his family kind of weasel away from the last battle after his mom lies to Voldemort. I'm pretty sure that's it. Like, there's no thank you for saving my life. There's no, like, standing up for Harry at all. Of course not. Um, so, yeah, he got no sort of redemption. Clarice, I, I get the feeling that going on this quest alone, even though she hasn't been on it that long at this point, has to be incredibly lonely. Like, literally, the only people she has to talk to are these undead Confederate soldiers who really are probably only interested in listening to her and only interested in so much as they owe Ares a favor. Like, you know, that's that's it. And so there's no emotional stake there. And yes. yeah. Clarice reminds me in, in these, honestly, this book forward, it gets much better as more time goes on. Like, just to give like perspective, like during the Heroes of Olympus books, like in The Lost Hero, when Percy is missing, um, and they get back to camp like Clarice is one of the people that the first thing they ask is where is like did you find Percy mm -hmm. and they and like Annabeth tells her no and she's upset about that like she cares about him she's out there looking for him with Annabeth trying to find him when she can leave camp and so they have like no bad blood whatsoever by the time we even get to like the last book in this series and so it's She's more of just someone that, because her dad is how he is, that I feel like she feels like she can't show any weakness and that she has to be like, I'm so big and bad. Look at how cool my ship is and look how undead all of my people are. And my dad is the best and all that kind of stuff because she feels like that pressure to like not not necessarily make him proud but like please him in some way like she's still trying to at this point which i can't blame her for wanting to try it especially because this is her first quest so this is her first chance to even try doing that and she basically like lets that go after this book i don't remember that ever being an issue after that but that doesn't really say much because i don't remember a lot so maybe it is but i don't i don't think in any other books going forward whatever is she just kind of is like my dad is my dad and he kind of sucks but i'm really good at fighting anyway <laughs> um but that's more what she's like and so that's a lot easier to handle um because she's not being 
overly mean or cruel or being a she's not actually being a bully mm-hmm. like it's it's way more obvious to tell like where she's coming from and also at the same time she also is just like she's admitting the like holes almost in her story like when percy is like you know where is anyone else and teases her she's like we had to leave them at camp to protect camp and it's like so she's being like oh my dad is so cool because he thinks that i can do this but it's like actually is he actually no? or like would you rather be at camp right now like helping everybody and you're forced to go on this anyway even though you don't want to be here and you're just trying to make the best out of this situation even when they're talking to her and telling her like trying to tell her like we can't go around the monsters and stuff that whole like discussion where they're all saying like this isn't gonna work it's also as it goes along you're also just like i generally don't know what else they could have she could have done even though it obviously doesn't go well the other options they have don't really work well either so like what was she supposed to do i don't i don't i don't know like i actually have an idea so like to get into the chill the scylla and charybdis part so um this is where we get the convergence of greek mythology and roman mythology that i was talking about that is so emblematic of the differences um in the greek mythology scylla and charybdis are most known from the odyssey where Circe had told um, Odysseus, sail closer to Scylla because Scylla has six heads and Scylla as a six headed monster can only grab as many men as she needs to fit into her mouth. And um, you can also pray to Scylla's monster mother and ask that Scylla not grab any more men than that. Mm -hmm. And so Odysseus has to choose, am I going to potentially wreck the ship and sail closer to Charybdis, or am I going to have to sail closer to this monster who's going to take six of them anyway? And he chooses to go to the monster. It takes six, and um, I mean, it it was a sacrifice of six, but he doesn't come out with any men. Like, he doesn't. Um, the, The Aeneid eventually says there were two men that escaped, one of which is one that Aeneas meets after Scylla and Charybdis. So um, the cheap shot here is that Odysseus was able to go by sailing closer to to Scylla. Jason and the Argonauts, which also is another myth that this book heavily favors, um, he was able to go through the wandering rocks, which Annabeth mentions, Mm -hmm. um, because he was guided by Thetis, Achilles' mom, who is a Nereid. So they literally had goddess GPS, essentially. Mm-hmm. And um, like, you can't do it without that, and especially in the CSS Birmingham, because like I said earlier, it's a wooden ship with iron on top. So you hit a rock, you're hitting a rock on wood and that's <laughs> not gonna work. So, um, and then Charybdis, they weren't supposed to be in the deep ocean anyway, in a ship that was built for civil war era. So going towards a whirlpool, that's why we have Tyson all of a sudden saying, oh shit, I can hear the pistons, something's wrong. Um, yeah, this is going to blow up. Yeah, but so the idea, oh wait, I didn't get to the Aeneid. So the Aeneid, how Aeneas gets around Scylla's and Charybdis, this is so cheap, it's such a cheap shot by the Romans, he's able to sail around. <laughs> so both of the Greek heroes had to go through and Aeneas just can go around. So part of that is because Virgil puts the Aeneid in actual real life locations, because again, this is supposed to be mythology that then um, leads into Roman history. So everything is real. All of the places are real. And um, so he's able to say they sail around Sicily, but we can't map out where Scylla and Charybdis are based on the Odyssey's description and those islands. So we can't say that that same path around existed for him. Plus, um, like the idea of Aeneas versus Odysseus is supposed to be Odysseus loses literally every single one of his men. He loses a good chunk of his fleet via the Lystragonians, and then the rest ate some sacred cattle and got oofed by Zeus, you know? So 
Um, he survived with nobody. Aeneas, pretty sure, unless they died of natural causes, his men make it. And um, not only that, but after he gets around Scylla and Charybdis and he gets to Polyphemus's island, he finds a man who was left behind by Odysseus. And so uh, this guy's like, I, I was left behind in Polyphemus's cave, but I hid and I escaped. I, if you are Trojans, I'd rather you kill me as a Greek than me die by this, this Cyclops, or you could just take me with you. And so they opt to take him with them. And it was a way of the Romans being like, look at our military prowess. Look at how great our leaders are compared to the Greek leaders because Odysseus lost all of his men. And Aeneas is taking on Greek men now because another one that got left behind is in Circe's, like still transformed into like a pig or something. Hmm. Yeah. So so Zoe, Zoe Nightshade doesn't like Percy at first. <laughs> Stories like this. Um... Yeah, I don't even know what to say. Like, of course, Romans make it better because they wrote theirs afterwards. Yeah, after so they would they would do that um, and be like, look how amazing we are. Our lives are amazing. Obviously, you can just sail around it. Like, okay, you don't think that people would have done that if they could have done that the first time around? I'm pretty sure they would have done that if it was possible yeah. for them to do that. And this story shows it. At least how this one happens it's not possible for them they tried they really tried they they thought of like they listed off like four different things they could do mm -hmm. and especially when percy's talking about it he very much has like the kind of just i don't know outlook of like this is never gonna work and there's nothing we can do about this so my idea and i don't know if this one would work but i would still sail closer to scylla i would go the odysseus route but I would only have the top deck stocked with the Confederate soldiers. I don't know how long that would work because I imagine they don't taste as good as fresh humans. But um, I it had, I mean, Scylla would be occupied if she grabbed six little undead Confederates. Um, so I don't know, like, even if I had to choose between the impossible options, because this is literally the rock in the hard place kind of thing. If I had to choose, I would still choose Scylla, and I would try to find a way to only have Scylla snatch the undead people. Mm -hmm. They would probably have been okay with that. Like, I'm, I was just thinking, like, would they be okay with the undead soldiers being taken instead of them? Um, because if anything, Greek demigods have a whole guilt complex. Um, they don't like people doing things, dying on behalf of them. But they probably would have, if for no other reason, than it was the only thing they could think of. Yeah. Um, to get out of there alive. But it just, it was a lot <laughs> for all of them to try to figure out at the same time. It's like, I don't know what else they could have tried to do in that situation than that. Um, it's another, like, imagining seeing that on the show, it's a kind of similar situation like the arch is in st louis in season one where like everything is going wrong in that episode at the same time it does a really good way of showing how hard it is for them to survive in a world like this and how they've been abandoned like you know they don't even have time for percy to like jump into a lake to see if he would get if he would stop getting poisoned to death because echidna is trying to kill them and they have no other choice but to run into the arch and then they're screwed <laughs> when she can get in there and so this feels like a similar situation of all three of them and tyson even listing off all the things that are happening and trying to like problem solve and it's every single thing that they could think of is just like there's something in the way that stops it from working mm -hmm. um, primarily this time because aries gives her the worst ship possible yep like it's really his fault that this happened to them yeah, like like I said, what my brother told me is had he chosen a different era, there was a chance that that ship could have made it. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's interesting that he picked, I mean, there were naval battles in the Civil War, but they weren't very technologically advanced. So he could have chosen another, you know, like naval battle to, because I don't know that it necessarily has to be at that spot. You know, like, I feel like 
Ares is a god. He could summon a ship from anywhere. He could have summoned any sunken ship he wanted, repaired it magically, and had the fleet be whatever leaders he wanted that were fallen soldiers. Theoretically. Like, I don't see why it has to be one ship that and, like, its exact crew. I wanted to talk about Tyson. Um, I love Tyson, and so the end of these chapters made me really sad, but um, for everyone really percy and tyson <laughs> even though i know that he's okay it still sucks a lot um i thought that it was sweet when they are by monster donut mm-hmm. um and i appreciate the joke that rick riordan makes that franchise chains pop up so fast because they're part of hydra's arms mm-hmm. or heads or wh- however they put it again and that when and that I liked the part when Percy chops one of them off accidentally and she's like, you just made another franchise. And he's like, does this matter right now? Yeah. <laughs> like I could literally like picture the actor saying something like that, like priorities. I don't care if there's another donut shop somewhere right now. Um, but I did like how, how Percy is like, I need to talk to Annabeth and find out why she has such a weird bias against Tyson. Um, because he hasn't done anything at this point to like justify that. And there's obviously something there that I don't know. Um, mm. And I always really like, I really like him admitting that he's jealous of them being in a, a hideout place that Luke and Thalia and Annabeth used when they were younger, mm-hmm. because it's that whole thing of never feeling like you belong <laughs> or like even where you feel like you might belong you don't really belong like that whole idea of like even in my group of friends i feel like if i wasn't there anymore that nobody would care that i would they would just like continue on without me as if i was never there in the first place that's a very like abuse sort of dynamic thing that happens a lot and that's definitely percy like he never had people in his life in that way so he would feel like that and so I like him just being able to admit it because I feel like that all the time. Um, I have since I was a kid and it still is something that I'm I'm not gonna pretend like I don't feel jealous of people. I do, like almost everyone. <laughs> I don't mean to sound like horrible, but it's just as a fact, like I don't have anybody in that way. Like I have some family now, but I don't have friends or partners or anything. And so seeing people have that stuff seemingly so easy and it's impossible for me, you can't help but feel jealous that they got something that you've never been able to get. Mm -hmm. And so that's very much what he feels. Um, Sometimes people misconstrue that to mean like romantic jealousy. And I kind of assume that that's because a lot of the kids who read these books for the first time probably just assumed that jealousy means something in romantic situations. Um, that's the way that most people talk about it but i don't think that it's something like that i think it's more he's jealous that she had these people that made her feel understood and were protecting her when has anyone protected percy like that like he's the one usually protecting everyone else chiron is trying to protect him but he still can't like i honestly don't know i'm thinking of all the books but i honestly don't know of a time when somebody like makes a hideout purely for him to like hide in so that he doesn't have to deal with dealing with everyone. He's the one that has to deal with Luke all the time. (laughs) And people get mad at him because he doesn't want to. It's the other way around. He's basically protecting everybody else from that whole situation of Luke and who he really is. And so he doesn't get protected that way. So it's hard to see other people get that. So I appreciated that. And I thought it was really adorable that he's like, Tyson, go find some powdered donuts. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to eat some powdered donuts. And he was like, okay, I will find some. And he comes back five minutes later, here you go. And it's like, wait a second, (laughs) we're we're, we're in the middle of the woods. And he's just like, whatever, he's just eating them. And like, I just thought it was cute how Annabeth was like, there's something suspicious about this. And Percy's like, you know what? I don't even care. (laughs) Like, he's like, Tyson's happy. He's eating his donuts. They're not killing him because he's obviously eating them. So I'm just going to let him have this win. (laughs) Because what else are we going to do at this point? We're in like a swamp in the middle of nowhere. 
of course there's a donut shop that just pops up right next to us that is in no way suspicious like well what else am i supposed to do at this point this is absolutely ridiculous like whatever tyson just eat your damn donuts and have a nice time because at least we have that going for us um but it's also it makes me sad that like the last thing that annabeth says before clary before the hydra shows up and then clarice and she never gets to finish her story is like you can never trust a cyclops and i'm like that's so freaking frustrating and i know that that's the whole thing that rick riordan is doing with that story is showing how those like prejudices against people can be irrational because at this point it's very irrational to yeah. still feel that way about tice or to like those like prejudices against people can be irrational because at this point it's very irrational to yeah. still feel that way about Tyson or to like, it's just funny that they're sitting there talking about how traumatic running into Luke was when she's sitting there trying to get Percy not to trust Tyson. And it's like, out of both of these people, which one is the bad guy again? <laughs> like, I, I think Tyson's fine. He's eating donuts. What is wrong with the child? There's nothing wrong with the child. And so it just is, su it sucks. It supremely sucks that she like, isn't able to like, let any of that stuff go before he seemingly blows himself up to mm -hmm. help them. Um, I, even though I knew that was happening, I was like, oh God, it's already happening. Cause this is like making me really sad that Percy is going to have to think that his brother sacrificed himself for him. That's literally the worst case scenario mm -hmm. of his life. He can never possibly, you can never possibly imagine a worse thing for him anyway, happening than something like that. Pretty much that's worse than him, way worse than him actually dying is Tyson seemingly doing it. And I love how Percy is Percy <laughs> and that when, when Tyson is in that room, he tries to run in to save him. Even though Annabeth is like, you will die if you go in there. He's like, I don't care. Like, do you think I care? I don't care. Like, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving him to die in there. Like, are you cra like crazy? He would never do that. And he just by happenstance doesn't actually get blown up. Because mm -hmm. um, the what it, that monster name grabs him. Um, yeah. But I, the whole time I was imagining that. First off, I was just imagining like that stunt is going to be crazy to have him to have him be grabbed by that monster and then be like flung into the air when he's able to get the monster off of him and then the ship blows up so he gets like flung into the water and just crashes in like the most aggressive violent way possible and it's especially i could like literally picture them ending like an episode with that especially because the first thing he asks when he wakes up is where is tyson and Annabeth has to say, like, I'm sorry, but I don't think he survived. And Percy is just like, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> um, I don't know. And it, so, yeah, that's going to be, it will be interesting to see that on the show and how they, I generally don't remember what happens to make Annabeth stop being so freaking prejudiced against Tyson. I, I know that it happens because when they interact in other books, she's very sweet with him. Mm -hmm. And he loves her and like gives her hugs all the time. And she loves him too. And so I know that she gets over it at some point in this book. And I'm like, can you just do this already? Yeah. Would you stop being mean to the autistic child? <laughs> like, please. Yeah. And he doesn't even realize that she doesn't like it. Like, that's the sad part. Because they have him like grabbing her hands and stuff. Like, He's fully scared while they're surrounded by these monsters. And then he goes down and fixes the ship anyway. I'm just, mm -hmm. yeah, Tyson is a treasure. And um, it's going to be a rough scene, like you said. We know from Walker and how he is in interviews and behind the scenes that he is going to eat up the special effects and the, um, the stunts involved in all of that, he's probably going to want it to look like the book. He's probably going to be like, yes, drop me onto a flaming ship. Yeah, yeah. like he's going to be, that's going to be so much fun for him to film the parts that they will allow him to film. Yeah. Um, 
that's going to be really fun for him to do and it'll definitely be like complicated stunt work with their stunt team to do all of like that's going to be a whole huge thing um for them to pull all of that stuff off all at once anyway it's going to be really great to watch that happen one day and and all that kind of stuff it's just a wild like especially <laughs> Especially because the next chapter is Cersei's Island, and I'm like, can they relax? Like, this is like the most ridiculous day. This is like the la like, it's like this on quests, I get it, but this quest particularly because of how they were like forced to leave mm -hmm. the way that they did, everything happens in such a ridiculous way that it's like, can they calm down? Have they even gotten to sleep yet? <laughs> like, yeah. I don't even know. Like, this is all happening so fast. And now he's going to get turned into a fucking hamster. <laughs> like, and, and I don't even, I don't really even remember everything that happens on Cersei's Island. But, but it's like, it's not like they have a chance to stop. And it, oh, also, the other thing about these chapters is that, of course, he has another dream about Grover where, um, Polythemus sees that Grover is like trying to take this the the this, this stuff out, and is like, oh, I can fix that, so everything will be done by tomorrow. And he's talking about like, oh, don't worry, if people show up here, I have things to stop them from getting here. And it's like, oh, this is just super <laughs> of him in the middle of all this. They did sleep then because he has a horrible nightmare about his best friend dying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, but. But it's just like every time he sleeps, he has a dream about Grover being in like mortal danger, or and photos. yeah, or both, <laughs> and and like in them, and it's like okay, so after all of this stuff, we're gonna have to show up on wherever Grover is, and more things are going to attack us when we get there. This is so great. <laughs> yeah, they have not been able to catch their breaths. This one is one after the other, and I feel like. In a way, Rick is trying to mimic the cadence of the Odyssey where it feels like everything's happening one after the other, but it only feels that way in the Odyssey because he's telling the story to somebody. Like It's a story within a story, in a sense, because we start with him on Calypso's island, then he makes it to the island of this princess where he tells you know, like some of the rest of the lore, and it's not in order. So um, it feels like in the Odyssey, oh, like all of these things happened to Odysseus, but it's really over the span of seven years. And most of it happened within the first two or three months. Um, so yeah, I feel like Rick's trying to mimic that a little bit with the pacing here. Mm -hmm. um, and also just, I mean, the sea of monsters is the way that he is connecting the Odyssey and Jason and the Argonauts. So I I do feel like he wants to hit all of those same beats because I feel like Jason and the Argonauts might also encounter Cersei. Um, so hitting these beats one after the other kind of also follows the general rules of like, you know, the path of monsters you end up going down. And it does fit with like the general like theme of this book which is that camp is dying mm -hmm. and so everything is rushed because they are they are rushed like regardless it's like every they need to move as fast as humanly possible mm -hmm. and so like the first book there was a deadline but they had like two weeks or something to mm -hmm. reach that deadline in this one it's like the longer we're away from camp the more kids are dying and we don't even know who's alive still and so the like kind of almost like panic like panic like energy <laughs> that they all feel about all of this fits like the general thing of the odyssey anyway because that's a very like panic inducing sort of story of like one after another and it fits that general theme of they feel like all this pressure to rush but the more that they rush the more things go wrong um like how these things tend to happen in these sort of stories <laughs> Yeah, and um, so it's, yeah, it's a group of monsters that they're having them encounter them in similar order to Greek myths that we've already seen and still changing it. I mean, I love what they're doing with the Golden Fleece. I don't think that, I can't say for sure because I haven't read Jason and the Argonauts. I just know a little bit of the lore here and there, but I don't 
think it's necessarily part of the lore that it enhances the aroma and the um the colorfulness the vibes of all the plants around the area um so that is definitely more i feel like rick expanded on it if anything they might have there might have been a throwaway line here or there mm -hmm. um but yeah I, I just i don't know this was my favorite book i remember it being my favorite book for that reason because it does feel like this one is so heavy on the greek mythology it is it's there's so much of that happening because it's kind of in a weird plot wise it's kind of in like a weird in between place like plans are happening but they haven't actually fully come to fruition yet mm -hmm. like they do make a a comment of like luke let us get away too easy and it's like yeah because if he doesn't kill them then he wants them to get the golden fleece for him basically yeah in his mind they'll he doesn't care how many kids die in the meantime but at some point he thinks well if they don't if i don't kill them right now then they can get the fleece back and bring thalia back and then thalia will join me and i won't need percy anymore mm -hmm. and so if i don't kill him now i'll just kill him later i love how annabeth shut that one down too because she was she was telling percy he is so, or you are so much like Talia. It's crazy. And that's how I know, because you would never join Luke. And that's probably the only way she could have explained it where he's like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's silliness too. Like Thalia would never, obviously would never join Luke either. Um, she gets one of the best moments ever with him because she, because he's so sure about that. And he is, it's not possible to be more wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's I great mean, that she gets that. So the reason, the connecting factor is the not being completely pleased with your parents, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is the connecting factor between Luke, Percy, and Talia. But like, I think, I, here, I think it's very funny that in a world like this, where nobody talks about how unhappy they are, which is like every abusive family in existence, mm -hmm. that the fact that Thalia and Percy say out loud, I don't like my dad sometimes, means that people think that they would murder everyone. Like, to Annabeth, the idea that one of them might join Luke and kill everyone they know is possible because them just saying out loud, my dad sucks sometimes, is that dangerous of a thing to say. It's like, that's amazing because that that is how it is in families like that like you say like one thing and people and everyone looks at you like you're like a demon <laughs> from the underworld and it's usually like very small things mm -hmm. of like i don't like it when he raises his voice and they just look at you like you just like grew 16 heads and are like talking in like tongues or something. Um, so that's very accurate, but I just think it's so funny how repressed, like talking about your emotions are in, in situations like that, where Annabeth legitimately asks him that. <laughs> like, I know you're mad at, at Poseidon sometimes, would you be willing to kill us all because it made your dad unhappy? No, <laughs> like, no, it just, it reminds me so much of, you know, the videos on here sometimes that I I ignore with every fiber of my being of like a parent yelling about their no contact children mm -hmm. of just being like, you're a monster, you're, you want to kill me. And it's like, no, I just want you to shut the fuck up. That's, that's literally all it is. I just want my dad to not abandon me constantly and acknowledge that I exist. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. <laughs> And with like with Zeus, actually that goes with Zeus too. Zeus can shut the fuck up. Uh, um, in one of the interviews with Walker, he mentioned that I thought was a, a smart way to put it that I hadn't considered before, that Thalia and Percy are similar, but they also show how different their parents are. And the fact that they're similar but different is a good way of showing why Poseidon and Zeus can also never get along. Because yeah, Thalia and him do not get along at all at first. It she's she's the type of person that puts people through a lot of stuff to like prove 
that mm -hmm. she can trust them. And she's also just someone that is kind of taking out things that she doesn't like on Percy because he's, it's easy to take it out on him. Like she's upset that Luke is evil. Mm -hmm. She's a, She doesn't like it that Annabeth is closer to Percy than she is with her anymore. And so when Annabeth is gone, she basically has like free reign to like treat him like garbage. And Annabeth isn't there to like, you know, stop her or even just make her feel bad about doing it. Like there's a part in, in Capture the Flag in the third book where she electrocutes him twice. Mm -hmm. for no reason like there's no actual reason for it she the first time she does it and she says it's an accident and he gets mad and throws water on him on her and is like oh that was an accident too it's in no way like dangerous to her for her to just be wet and mm -hmm. in response to that she electrocutes him again and so that's their dynamic for a good part of titan's curse she's very hard on him and put and just for nothing <laughs> he hasn't actually done anything to justify her being that hard on him in that way but their dynamic is very much like that where they get along sometimes but then other times Thalia likes having if she has a fatal flaw I think her fatal flaw is needing to be in control mm -hmm. um, which is also something Walker said in that same interview and I was like yes correct child good job um because he because yeah like even her sacrificing herself um the way that she does is her taking control like instead of running into camp and taking the chance that something might work out instead i'm going to sacrifice myself so that i can take control of my fate and not have to wonder if i'm going to be okay anymore and instead i'll just kill myself instead of taking the chance that everything will work out and so even though they both do the same thing, like sacrificing themselves is for completely different reasons. Like she does it to feel like she's in control of things. He does it because he doesn't think that he matters as much as other people. Yeah. It's that, it's that sort of dynamic. And I'm really interested to see if they do any flashback scenes with her at all in this season. I hope that they do just yeah. purely because I know everybody wants, literally everyone who loves Percy Jackson wants to see her and would want, because the the thing I forgot to say earlier about when Annabeth is telling like their a little bit of their backstory that she doesn't get to finish is um, she says that she thinks that the Cyclops they ran into mm -hmm. is the reason why they don't make it back to camp. That's not, Luke is the reason why they don't make it back to camp. And so one of the things I think is always really interesting about Percy stuff in general, and from like the different perspectives they show things from, is that like in her mind, remembering things when she was seven years old, she sees Luke as like this hero person that's doing all these things and showing that he cares in a way that her dad never did. And so mm -hmm. she thinks that he's amazing. And so to little her, like it wouldn't enter her mind that he is actually the problem <laughs> that him like trying to battle everything they run into and starting all of these fights is actually the reason why they don't make it back to camp on time and so that's part of why i really want them to sh actually show a flashback of that at some point in mm -hmm. this season or next season or something or even seasons after that because it would show how like to annabeth this is what's going on but us as the audience would probably have a totally different interpretation of watching things because we would pick up on stuff that little her would not be able to see. And it, whenever she tells Percy that whole story, he, I don't think he agrees with her. Yeah. Like, but it's just one of those things of real life, like she does not understand that quite yet. Um, well, it's also interesting. So knowing that the problem with Luke is that he, he wanted to fight everything. Mm -hmm. And they're literally at one of their little camps, you know, like kind of calling back to that trio. And here at this camp is where they do their tactical retreat from the Hydra. They don't try to fight it. I mean, Percy mistakenly takes off the head before he remembers, oh shit, I'm not supposed to do that because it's instinct. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, they're not really engaging in this fight. They're trying to retreat and they eventually end retreating. So, 
you know, it's it's almost like it should click for her that tactical retreat is an option in battle. You are the goddess of warfare's daughter. You should know this. You should know what a tactical retreat is. Um, but you were seven. So this guy who, I mean, it's almost more Aries energy of going in there and I want to defeat all of the monsters. Yeah, he's not a smart dude. There's a reason why <laughs> Athena got mad at Ares on the battlefield in Troy. Yeah, and I think that's why the talking about this stuff in this season is going to be interesting for the audience to watch. One of those things, like I said, they did well about season one, where they showed us that this world is um, vicious towards the people in it, and that you should be you should be upset that these kids are dealing with this stuff. In this way, with this stuff with Luke, it's like, well, they run away from the Hydra because they realize this is a better idea they try to find a way to get around the monst the sea monsters without having to actually fight them but they don't have a way to get around them so they have to fight them even with cersei they basically like i can't remember everything that happens but they still basically try to run out of there as fast as possible it's not like they stop cersei or anything like that they just leave what she's doing there and just go and so a bunch of times, even with them, like, jumping off of Luke's ship and running away, like, a million times in a row in this in this book, they make the choice to, like, leave a place where instead of staying and fighting. Mm-hmm. And so that's very much, like, Percy and Annabeth do that a lot as the books go along, is they pick and choose what battles to fight. And it's one of those funny things that even somebody who is really smart like intelligent like book wise even or just intelligent in general like Annabeth doesn't like still has those like blind spots where she doesn't notice where she doesn't notice that she doesn't even agree with what past her beliefs (laughs) but it hasn't like clicked yet that like current times Annabeth wouldn't make the choices that back when 14 year old 15 year old Luke is doing um but she looks at up at at him like he's a hero because of those decisions even though she would be yelling at him like current her right now would be yelling at him for trying to do that yeah (laughs) it's just one of those things that that's why I hope they do that is to show that stuff because it just makes the point so blatant for the audience of us being like wait a second what is what is going on here (laughs) Well, I I hope that they show so much more of this season from Annabeth's perspective in general, because I, I've seen it done well with some YA novels where they'll switch protagonists as the series goes on. So like if it's a group, then book one is the main protagonist, but then book two might be from one of the other group members' perspectives. Um, and I think... I feel like this book could have benefited from it in a way to get some of that backstory from Annabeth a little bit more. And I can see them fixing that with the show. I can see Rick being like, you know what, let's get in Annabeth's head. Let's show some of these scenes. Let's show her as a little kid running away with Luke and Talia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's what everyone wants for this season is to see like what she thinks was happening during all of those times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and um let's see we talked a bit about the piece with grover i mean that's going to be our first glimpse at um at polyphemus's island so i don't know that they'll do it that way because it doesn't hit the same for a show i think to show like in a dream sequence this is where you guys are going to end up ultimately Mm -hmm. but i do love that even though grover and percy aren't able to talk to each other in this dream sequence that as scary as it is for him to witness this talk where he's like, I have all these protections on this island, at least he's prepared. At least now he can mentally prepare for, okay, well, once I get on the island, there's going to be other shit. I can deal with that later, but at least I know. Yeah. Like, at least I know when we get there that we should watch out when we first approach because something, something is going to be on us as soon as possible. Yeah. That's always helpful. Yeah, so as as annoying as it is and as terrifying as it is, at least at least it was somewhat helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um I I don't how much time has passed? That's like the question that I have because 
the last dream sequence we had with Grover, he was given three days to finish his weaving. And in this oh, one, so after he's caught, it's you have one day left and I'm going to give you this special fleece to spin into yarn. But honestly, that feels like it would slow down the process because then you have to like card and spin and all of that, like process it to make it yarn before you weave it. They are almost there. Like I do remember that like right after they get off of Cersei's Island is when they end up getting there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember exactly how that happens besides the fact that Percy is his own little compass and just knows exactly where everything is, mm -hmm. which is one thing that they did um, show us in this, in this, in these chapters as well, is the fact that he somehow just knows where they are yes. <laughs> at all times. And it's like, I don't know what I just did, <laughs> um, but okay, that's weird. But so I think some of that stuff comes into play where they're able to find like the coordinates and all that kind of stuff. Um, because I do remember the them on that island is a whole like longer sort of sequence of the different fights that they get into and things like that before they can actually get back to camp. Mm -hmm. So they do get there, they get there pretty much like right when they need to in order to save him. Um, but it's it's pretty much like they get there right on like the last day when everything is happening. Yeah. I do love that detail that he knows exactly where he is on water, <laughs> that it's just coming up. That is going to be one of the golden lines from Walker, I'm sure, of this season. Yeah, like, I don't know, like, when Annabeth's like, how did you know that? And he's like, or he says something like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> like, I was, like, picturing Walker's face when he was doing that, um, of just being like, what did I just do? Why do I know that? Where did that even come from? What's going on? And Annabeth being like, that must be because of your dad. And he's just sitting there like, that was weird. <laughs> like, he can't go in in the air. So I guess that's like the the thing he has to settle with is that he knows everywhere he is when he's on water. Yeah, I also love that he can notice the difference between fresh and salt water without like, yeah, yeah a taste or I guess smell could be a giveaway for some people, but not at the switch point. Yeah, that when they go into like the swamp area that he feels like less energy mm -hmm. basically i liked that and i i could like very clearly picture where they were because even though i live very much not in the south um mm -hmm. there are areas like that where i live because there's tons of lakes where where i live and so i've been in places like that <laughs> even if they weren't in the south so i could like very clearly picture like yeah i could see why even though there's a bunch of water that he wouldn't have the same energy from that water because it's all murky and dark and seaweed and gro and like m what we just call muck on the mm -hmm. bottom that like sticks to your feet like the kind of place you you have to wear water shoes in order to swim in it yeah 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 that'll be interesting um i'm trying to think what other details we have in this episode that we can talk about or in these two chapters um yeah, because we ended on that scene where we said they're going to have a really, really interesting little drop. But I guess one thing we could talk about, because I know you've been talking about it for a few days now, is there such a sharp contrast between adding more POC to the live show in Percy Jackson and in um, Hunger Games series, okay. we're, yeah. Somebody in my chat is asking what chapters we are on. And we'll do one we read are we yeah it's, yeah i think it's easier to know it's it the first chapter we're reading is cersei's island like yeah. that's the title of it so that's where we'll be what we'll be talking about next week yeah we're like mm -hmm. so we're a little past halfway so mm -hmm. yeah um we we're talking about hunger game stuff <laughs> yes yeah so the contrast between we have Rick Riordan, who originally wrote this first five books, very white. I mean, the characters are all white, but they added POCs in the adaptation. Um, whereas in Hunger Games, from what I know, based off of what the fandom says, is that people are very mixed race, that it's supposed to be kind of like a futuristic, people have mixed a lot. And Katniss is supposed to be olive skin, dark hair, dark straight hair. 
Um, Haymitch is the one that I'm seeing people talk about a lot, um, where Woody Harrelson plays him. So he's blonde hair, blue eyed, but he's not in the books. And um, yeah, so I know you've been talking a lot on your channel about the representation, but I just find it so interesting of a contrast, you know? Yeah, I, I was saying this to a friend today, but I feel like Rick Riordan has completely killed for me, the idea that people in Hollywood try to say of being like, oh, I want my my adaptation or whatever to be more diverse, but it's just Hollywood and the studios and stuff like that just won't let me. And I'm just like a sad little author and I can't do anything. No, you're a liar. You're lying. And I know for sure that you are because I'm sorry. Percy Jackson is on Disney Plus. Disney is one of the most conservative companies generally there is out there like it was a fucking joke that the florida governor decided to go after disney for being too woke what are you talking about out of every like disney is too woke are you kidding okay anyway um but like this is not like a uh like a forward-thinking company like that like the marvel movies took a bazillion years to have anybody of any sort of diverse at all and it took forever for any diversity at all to be in those movies. And it's still lacking a lot in like the, like the author, like not the authors, like the writers and producers and directors and stuff like that. It's pretty much Taika Waititi and nobody else in, in like those. And there's like 20 movies like that. And so it's not like Disney is known for that. And so when I look at Rick Riordan, I'm like, you actually mean it like clearly. And so that means that other authors don't, because if they did, they would make it happen. Like, I'm sorry, but if Rick Riordan can make, like, if you didn't watch or know anything about the Percy Jackson show, right? Like, let's say you just like somehow missed all of that. Like, let's say you're in a coma <laughs> and you, when all of the casting happened and then you saw a picture of like the cast, you would think that it was like a fan cast where they like race change all of the characters like there's there's like that happens and usually that's what fandom has to do in order to do diversity we have to write fan fiction where we force the race of the characters to change to other races because it's the only way that we ever get any actual diversity and things like this rick riordan did it in canon like he changed the race of basically every character except for percy and like if he would have found a percy that was better than walker he would have picked that percy even if he wasn't even if it was a person of color and like i generally believe that walker was just the best person that they saw for that part because of how they casted literally everyone else mm -hmm. and so when you look at this sort of a production that not only has a lot of diversity in the cast of the actors it also has a lot of women there's and also there a black woman was like the only woman that was credited for one of the episodes like there are at, there are writers in the writers room but it's mm -hmm. a different thing to be a to be like a writer that is part of the writers room versus one that is like credited where when you look up the the writers on like wikipedia they're listed and she is listed for episode 5 i think mm -hmm. and so like she's the only other person besides like the like white dudes that we know of that are like the showrunners also of the show that are accredited in that way for any of the other episodes and there's a woman that was a director for two of the episodes and some most productions don't even have those things and so it's not like it's perfect like the showrunners are still like white men generally but it's just showing that if you want to do that you will and i think because of that the argument can be made that Rick Riordan didn't put in any diversity or anything like that in the first five books because he was a new author and he wanted to get published. And it was just taking things out of his books that would make it harder for him to get published. Because as soon as he was a known author, he like literally shoved in every form of diversity he possibly could. Like, you don't know anything about Heroes of Olympus, but Piper is an indigenous person who lives on a reservation. She like gets mad at the camp being called Camp Half Blood because she thinks it's them questioning like her blood quantum, and like Leo is um, 
is like Latina who speaks Spanish and speaks Spanish in the book and all that. He's very much, I'm sure, based on people that Rick actually knew since he grew up in Houston, Texas, and he's from Texas. And there's other characters, like Nico comes out as being gay in that book. And and there's other characters like, oh, Frank. Frank is Chinese. <laughs> and so there's a whole story about his Chinese ancestry. Mm-hmm. Hazel is, is Black and is from New Orleans. And so she's like Creole and talks like Creole and talks like that kind of Creole French and stuff in the books and stuff. And so literally, literally, it's like a, it's like a meme. You see videos like this sometimes from Percy Jackson fans on here that there, that one audio where it's like, (laughs) there's an audio goes around that people make jokes about because the only white people on the ship that they're on and with all seven main characters in heroes of olympus when they're on their quest are percy and jason (laughs) and so there's like a joke that jason will sometimes say stupid things that like what like there's this audio that goes around of a white person being like you can't deny my culture my culture is potato salad or something like that and people, Percy Jackson fans use it all the time of like Percy like side eyeing the other the other problematic white person, the only other white person on the ship to tell him to shut the fuck up. But like that's and like the books going forward after that are Magnus Chase, where everyone is trans. <laughs> yeah. And the books after that are Trials of Apollo, and there is no way on earth that Apollo is straight. No, no, he never says like I'm bi or I'm pan, but he's definitely one of those things at least. There, he like thinks about how attractive men are constantly <laughs> as like the as like he's like the point of view for those books and then you know the sun and the star is the book about nico and his boyfriend going on a quest together and it, that's also the book where piper comes out as bi or pan or something and she has a girlfriend after dating a boy and so like all of those things happen all in a row there is no way that you could possibly get more diverse than all of that happening all in a row. And there's probably things that I'm like forgetting that are in like other short stories and things like that, that I haven't read yet. Cause I, for whatever reason, never read the short stories. I don't know why I just didn't. Um, but when you look at that, it's like, okay, <laughs> like he obviously was like, okay, now that I'm allowed to, let me make this as diverse as humanly possible and force Disney Hyperion books to publish all of this stuff. Yes, I'm going to make you publish a book with a 14 year old gay child. I'm absolutely going to make Disney Plus have a 10 year old child who is gay in season three of the show. And everyone is just going to be screaming about how gay he is the entire time. We're going to have so much fun watching tiny little Nico. And it's like, that's how this stuff should be. That's how these things should go. And so when you compare that to the Hunger Games, um, I, when I read the Hunger Games, I assumed that Katniss and Gail and Hamish, since people have mentioned Hamish, I didn't remember what he looked like in the books, but I believe them. I assumed that they were supposed to be indigenous people, like mm-hmm. from the Americas, that sort of like racial or ethnic like look they definitely are not white like at all like i can vividly remember when they announced the casting of jennifer lawrence and liam hensworth and i was like what (laughs) like that's not that's not what that's supposed to be at all and so um i have a whole like chip on my shoulder about about hunger games because so many people look at those books as if they are like radical or revolutionary for existing and so the author doesn't need to actually do anything to actually give a fuck about anything else because she wrote these books and so she's obviously going to save the world and i think i this is like a weird analogy but i feel like the fandom is almost like becoming aware right now with how they want haymitch to be a person of color even though that quite literally makes no sense whatsoever like you can't have it what's his face play a white dude with blonde hair play him in a trilogy of movies and then when he's 
And then when he shows him as a young teenager, he's suddenly a different race. Like that's just never, that's never going to work. And, but the whole thing that has always frustrated me personally about the Hunger Games, I read those books and I thought the first one was good. I thought the second one was less good. And I thought the third one was literal shit. And if I could have, I would have started it on fire. I like, I'm not even joking. I read the third book. I like downloaded it offline because I was a college student, had no money and couldn't buy the actual book, but I wanted to know how it ended. As soon as it ended, I deleted it from my, from my computer. I went and found the books that I had bought to buy it and threw them away. And I went into my sister's room because I lived with her at the time and told her to never read the books and never watch any of the movies. And we never did. I made my sister watch the first movie with me because she knew that I was reading the books and I liked it. And we didn't think the first movie was that good. The Hunger Games having movies at all to me shows that Suzanne Collins doesn't actually mean what people think she means because it's a joke to make a movie about the Hunger Games. Like Hollywood is making movies about the Hunger Games. Hollywood oh. is the capital you automatically like lose what you're trying to say if you are taking money from them so that you can sit in your mansion in Connecticut and do nothing and just put out these books and act like they're like revolutionary material that no one else could make. While taking stories of real life people of color but taking away all people of color from your books in when they're made into movies. And so it basically making a fortune off of real life people that are being harmed, but never actually acknowledging any of those real people being harmed. It's just really weird. Like Jennifer Lawrence is like defending Amy Schumer right now and is like pro Israel. I don't know what else to say to say that the movies are stupid and are not like what they should be like. Like, I'm serious that if Walker plays Hamish, which he should, he would, and he would be great at a role like that, it's literally the only thing that could get me to watch Hunger Game movies again. Because otherwise, I, like, I'm just like, I don't know why these movies exist. They shouldn't be here. This feels like a joke that there's, like, Hunger Games merchandise when the Hunger Games is calling out people making merchandise about itself. Like, what is going on? But, mm -hmm. so, like, when you see, like, it's too late for Hamish to be a person of color. If that actor was cast in that role, they would be slaughtered. Like the amount of harassment that person would get would be off the charts. It would be even worse than it normally would be because it generally does not make any sense for mm -hmm. it to, for him to be a person of color when he's older and then magically turn into a white person when he's that, no, that would be horrible. Like you can understand that these movies should be have people of color in charge but also none of you cared about that until now and i think that it's fascinating almost that people are almost realizing like i don't think these stories as are as woke as we want them to be because the thing with hunger games that always kills me is the character of gail mm -hmm. is the one that people usually hate i like him I never talk about that because people like every video about Hunger Games you see, people talk about how much they hate him. Gail is the revolutionary sort of character, like the rev wanting a revolution character that is like, we need to do more violent acts to take the fight to the capital. Mm -hmm. Peta is the literal soft bitch that is like, no, we can't fight. We need to like make bread and talk about how much we love each other. And that's the way that we're going to win against the capital. Like he is like the peace making one. And throughout those books, you are like, Gail is very much presented as a toxic manipulative jerk because they treat him like because he is angry and because he wants to take that anger out on the capital, like do things that you have to do when you're being oppressed that way he is seen as like the bad person and the villain. Like everyone in the, in the Hunger Games fandom essentially hate Gale. And I'm like, he is the, he is, he is that person. Like he is who you want everyone to be. He, he is the people that are like protesting. He is Palestinians trying to fight against being slaughtered by Israel. 
like you guys are usually on the side of this person but this book series made you hate him there is a problem with that like when i read these books i was just like i can't take any of this shit seriously because you're demonizing the one character that is right i don't like even though he does things in those books that are i'm sure like not that great i i'm like his characterization is so flawed because she wants so badly to do this message like she's literally doing the i'm gonna post a meme with martin luther king jr quotes Mm -hmm. as as like characters and that's what's going on here and so it like frustrates me that that (laughs) i did a video about how ridiculous like i did not know until the new book was announced that the author had not said anything at all about palestine i was like how do you write the hunger games and you say nothing about palestine like i feel like you should explode from like just the most ironic thing that's ever happened to me and it's not even happening to me it's happening to you and so i was legitimately shocked and it still shocks me that that is somehow true that she hasn't said anything and that people are trying to gaslight themselves into believing that this book is going to make some big statement about it and it's just like i don't know why you would have somebody as a favorite author that would let you wonder for this long what you what she thinks about genocide for eight months and is making you read a book to find out like that is if rick riordan did that i would drive to boston to slap him like he he would never do that because he wrote a blog about it 10 days after everything happened and so he did he doesn't do that he very much put himself out there and put himself open to critiques on for pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel, like there are critiques on both sides when it comes to what he said, but he still put himself out there and said something when he absolutely did not have to. And I'm sure Disney was very mad at him that he did that. Yeah. Like, especially in October, there's no way that they were like, yes, Rick Riordan, two months before your show starts, absolutely get on the internet and call Pal and say that Palestinians are being genocided by Israel and that it's wrong what's happening to them and that they deserve to have a state and they deserve to get funding to make themselves a viable state. That's absolutely what they wanted him to do. He did it anyway, because he cares about what his fans actually think of him. Yeah, Yeah. someone in my comments is saying she's trying to profit again off of Arab people's pain. Like, yes, like Rick Riordan in the past did things in some of his prior books that were like Arab sort of stereotypes. But the fact is that he like responds to when he makes mistakes he did that Mm -hmm. took himself off of social media because he didn't want to hurt his his like audience anymore and he started his imprint that's why he started his imprint because he realized like i'm fucking this up i'm not the one who should be doing doing this and telling these stories so i'm going to give people from these cultures a platform so they can do it because they should be the ones actually doing it it shouldn't be me Mm -hmm. like that is the best way to handle when you realize what you're doing is to cut off you harming your fans further and platforming the people who deserve it and so like he made mistakes but he has actually tried to change and has actually taken steps instead of just being like i'm sorry he's actually did things actionable things to fix what he did wrong and Mm -hmm. so Suzanne Collins doesn't do that. She takes the story of Palestinians basically and makes them fictional people and puts them into a fictional world as if like you need to do that to get people to give a shit about them. And so it's, I don't even know what to say about this stuff. Like I turned off the comments on the video I made because people kept being like, she wrote these books so she doesn't have to say anything. And it's like, why? Like, I thought that three weeks ago, everyone was like, cancel celebrities. But this girl, this woman in freaking Connecticut writes a, like the whitest bitch ever, like a rich woman who lives in Connecticut and like whitewashed her own book series on purpose. Like, absolutely let them do that. Like, she could have easily stopped them clearly because Rick Riordan stopped. If they tried to do any of that, he would be like, no absolutely not and so clearly she could have tried to make things different she didn't and so she let them do that to the to these movies 
And so she clearly doesn't care. And like, I don't know why people, I just, I don't get it. I don't know why people are willing to, like her books aren't even that good. Like, I don't know why people like them so much. They were very, they insanely disappointing to me. And maybe this is a thing of like, if you've never experienced anything like this before, you can just enjoy these books as like fiction. Mm -hmm. But I didn't like the Hunger Games to me feels like it feels like trauma porn. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. But that like, I know what it's I, I know what it's like to have somebody who's in total complete control of you that you can't do anything. You have to hide everything about you. You have to pretend like you're somebody that you're not. You have to hide the relationships that you do have from like the public eye. You can never calm down. You can never like drop the facade because if you do, you you could be in serious danger. Like these are not things that I haven't experienced before. I definitely experienced that for most of life. And so like a lot of the themes of the Hunger Games, I've experienced most of that, not from a totalitarian government, but from my stupid ass dad. And so like, I'm still protecting myself from him and he's been dead for 10 years. <laughs> so like yeah. he, it's, I know what this is like. And so reading a, this book series, it just kind of feels like, it feels like they're like weirdly romanticizing um that idea of putting people through that because i don't know like i generally don't know what susan collins wants you to think because i haven't thought about it enough honestly because it the ending pissed me off so much of like how easy it is for Peta to get over not knowing if his memories are real that's actually much harder to do in real life and um and then turning Gail into like a black and white, just a villain who blew up her sister. Like that was extremely disappointing. Like taking away all of his complexity into making him just like a bad, basically like a villain. Um, that was super disappointing. But PETA is like creepy. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know why people like PETA, I guess. And this has always been like an issue with, since I read those books, because his character is basically like, I've never talked to you before. We have no relationship. I, I'm literally that guy that just stares at you. Yeah. And like follows you around town. But somehow I'm in love with you to the point that I'm willing to kill myself in the Hunger Games for you when you have no idea who I am. We've never even met. We don't have a relationship and we don't know each other. I'm like, usually guys like that are suspicious <laughs> and are like creepy. Yet when people read him in these books they're like oh he's romantic and I love him and I'm like what <laughs> like why do you like him he's weird this is weird like should I am I supposed to be mad at Gail that he doesn't like PETA when this dude has no idea who Katniss is and just shows up after they've been friends their entire lives and have been through all the shit that they did like helping each other get enough food to survive that this dude shows up and she's suddenly in the middle of this fight with the capital and has to pretend like she's in a relationship with him because if she doesn't he she's gonna die mm -hmm. and it's just he kind of forces her in a weird way to be put in the middle of all of this stuff and i'm like i can't be upset at him for not liking Peta because of that and i also don't know why people look at that story as if it's romantic it's yeah. like it's sad and I, I really don't know, I feel like this weird thing is happening with Hunger Games fans right now, where they're like almost realizing that the books aren't as, as good as they want them to be. Um, through them wanting to make a white person magically a person of color when they're a teenager. I think that's them like rectifying with that of like, oh wait, these movies are super white. And these are actually like, they can tell me over and over again that Suzanne Collins doesn't have to say anything about Palestine, but I don't actually believe that they actually believe that. <laughs> like, I think they're just telling me that because they're, because they don't like to think about it. But it is, it's very hard to, for me to understand. It's hard for me to understand a public figure at all that would leave their fan base wondering how they feel about a genocide like this, especially when you wrote a book series that is basically about the Palestinian story. Um, District 12 is 
pretty much Palestine, like it's indigenous people mixed in with people that have colonized them a little bit like PETA's family. Um, but they're like very much in like out there t just taking care of themselves. They don't have any money. They don't have any support. They have to go and like, you know, hunt to find food to feed themselves because they don't have anyone else from anything. People in Palestine right now are literally being starved to death because the only food they get is from Israel and Israel won't give them anything. The capital won't give them enough food to survive on. And so they have to go and kill wild animals to survive on. It's very blatant. Mm -hmm. So an author like this, especially not saying anything about this and just kind of hand waving it, it just feels weird. Like they keep bringing up the thing she says of like, oh, I don't write Hunger Games books unless I have something to say as if it's like a big statement. And I'm like, do you know that's every author? Mm -hmm. Like nobody writes a book unless you don't, <laughs> if you don't have something to say. Well, I mean, and you think about it, if you're using a work of fiction to tell how you feel about something, how does J.K. Rowling feel about slavery? Uh -huh. you know? Yeah, like, you can write something and not agree with, because I'm not, I don't think J.K. Rowling meant to have slaves be happy they're enslaved. Like, I don't think she meant, meant it in the way that you can interpret it. You know, like, looking at historical events, looking at who this, these people are actually supposed to be. I don't think she actually intended that, you know, and she still made a really awful message with that. Um, you know, JK Rowling is a good example of the total and complete lack of education that England, I'll say England, cause I don't know about the other like English colonies. Like I don't know about Scotland or Ireland, but I at least know in England, they have a total and complete lack of education when it comes to slavery and the slave trade and how much they were involved with it. Like I've run into people online that end up outing how atrocious it actually is. They don't tell them anything. They make it sound like it wasn't that bad. And so um, I remember like when I was in school, there was some of that when we were little, but by the time I was in middle school, they were telling us like, no, this was fucking terrible. <laughs> And like, I can, like, I remember being in high school in US history class and everyone would stop and be like, why do we suck so much? Yeah. Like, we were learning about all the things we did, especially to um, indigenous people. Like we were very aware of that even, and I was in high school in like the 2001, 2002, 2003, that's when I was taking those classes. And so that was a long time ago before 9-11 even happened. And they were teaching us stuff like this in a very conservative place that I lived and they were still teaching us that stuff where it made us sit there and go, Ugh, like, why are we terrible? Oh my God, why did we do that to them? That doesn't make any sense. And um, so England does, doesn't, doesn't really do that. And so JK Rowling accidentally writing slaves are actually happy about being slaves. That is like synonymous to how they talk about you know, slavery and white supremacy and all that kind of stuff, they're still like, they're very unaware of what they're even saying a lot of the time. Like they genuinely don't think that they're racist, um, <laughs> which is just ridiculous. You literally passed Brexit. You're the one of the most racist countries in existence, like for everything that you've done up to right now. Like as bad as the United States is, we didn't actually pass a law saying that you can kick out immigrants for just existing. <laughs> like we never actually got that far. We People have wanted to do it. And if there was a like a vote for it, it wouldn't pass. Like it just, it wouldn't, that passed. <laughs> like you guys don't have voter suppression and that still passed somehow with like a 60% like a majority when, when that vote came up. And so you, you don't have the reasons why it's hard for us to vote. So there's no reason why that happened, except that that's really how you guys feel. And so it's not surprising to me that that happened with JK Rowling accidentally, but it's one of those things of like, if you don't have the proper like education or you don't almost don't want it, then you end up doing things that just make people feel horrible or just show how almost uneducated you are. Like, yeah. I know that Suzanne Collins went to school and got a degree in political science. Um, I know this only because I saw a few videos by somebody who was talking about this in the last couple of days, but like her on her website, she has a list of her favorite books and they're all white authors. Mm -hmm. Like she doesn't know anything about anything 
besides what she probably learned in school, which is very like white. And so it does, that's where she's coming from. Well, yeah, I mean, how many of our politicians majored in political science? That doesn't necessarily say you're going to be 100% sound on your ideas on policy and foreign involvement. Yeah, and so when I compare stuff like that to like someone like Rick, like he clearly talks to people who are different from him. He co-wrote a book with a gay person of color. Like he, the the Sun and the Star is writ, co-written by Mark Oshiro, which is a very well-known, very out like gay, like Latina author. He is most all of his I I haven't actually read his YA books, but I know that a lot of people really like them. But he literally co-wrote that book with him and told him like I want you to basically go through this and fix my script. I want you to go through this book and fix what I messed up because I know that I'm not going to get everything right. And I've seen like an interview, at least one with Mark, where he was like literally crying, <laughs> like crying in the interview, talking about Rick Riordan because he read the script and he was like, I don't need to do anything. He's like, you did, you did such a good job with this. Like I haven't actually read the sun and the star because it will probably make me cry. Um, there's a whole story about with Bob. Um, you don't know who Bob is, but <sighs> he's in House of Hades. And to sum him up, he's somebody who helps Percy and Annabeth when they're in Tartarus and they have to leave him behind. Mm -hmm. And it's imagine Percy having to leave somebody behind who yeah. helped him. It's horrible. It's horrific how he feels about Bob. Like one of the saddest lines is because Bob is saying like, I just want to be able to like see the stars again. And when they get out of Tartarus and they're back on the ship, like Percy's by himself and he looks up at the stars and he says, Bob says, hello. And you want to go jump off of a cliff when that happens because of how depressing all of that stuff is. And so I know that the general plot of that book is that Nico goes back to get Bob out of Tartarus for Percy and Annabeth and that he talks to them beforehand and tells them what they're doing. And he, they tell him not to go, but he does it anyway. And they get Bob out of Tartarus. And, but there's very much an allegory with Bob about how a lot of books equate queerness with monsters. And it very much like says that this is wrong and this is bad. And that queerness does not make you monstrous or a bad person or anything like that. And it, that it's never too late to like change who you are because Bob is actually um, a Titan. He's most of life, he's a really bad person, but he ends up becoming a much better person. And so it's very much a story like that of it's never too late to be yourself mm -hmm. and to like be your true self. And if you're going to write a book about with queer characters, that's the way to actually write it. And you don't write a story like that with those sort of themes if you don't know what queer people actually deal with. That's mm -hmm. like one of those things of it shows people's like ineptitude when they write queer stories and they don't realize when they're kind of walking into tropes that are harmful to the community because they don't interact with the community enough to even know what is harmful to them like like jk rowling's just like stamping gayness on dumbledore's head and not thinking about and because she doesn't know anything about queerness or queer people or anything like that she didn't even know that the idea that Dumbledore's like boyfriend is an older man is kind of a bad idea. Like the idea that he's kind of, that would be like a grooming relationship because of how much older what's his face is than him. And so that's actually a really negative trope, you know, for queer relationships to imagine that an older man has to like, you know, almost like get you into relationship like that under false pretenses and stuff she and doesn't have to be evil <laughs> like and he turns out to be the, the pre yeah, hitler and, he, and like the idea that an evil person is the one that opens you up into this identity and so that there's a million negative connotations with that relationship she doesn't know anything about any of this stuff so she didn't i don't even think she knew the harm that she was doing when she did that because she doesn't actually care and that's like, I guess, the main reason why I talk about Rick Riordan like that is like, I don't think that he is a perfect person at all. I don't try to idealize celebrities or public figures at all. Like sometimes it can happen, but I 
I actively try not to and I want to see them more as like regular people because that's what they really are okay. and I'm not one to like say that somebody does one bad thing wrong so I'm like never going to speak or like like them ever again like sometimes people do shitty things but then they realize what they did and they try as long as they seem like they understand why people are upset and try to actively fix things I can I, I'll, I'll deal I'll like I can forget forgive them or like be willing to like work with them still it's the situations where they don't seem to try and they very obviously don't care that i'm like i don't know why people think like you deserve better like suzanne collins wrote a good book series sure but there's a lot of problems with it when you think about it now for longer than a couple minutes at a time it's not as good as people want it to be and it's okay to like look back at it now and even if you do love it for what it is it's kind of important to look at it as who wrote it and what is lacking from it and what is lacking from her now like it's it just makes me sad to think that like there's so many palestinians that are on tiktok right now begging for money and like legitimately hurts my soul every single day seeing all of them because I can't give them any money because I don't have any money and I, I really wish that I had money that I could give them because I would give them everything if I had any at all and that's bad enough already um and it's makes me sad to think that somebody like that one of those families could run into a, a video of somebody making a video trying to justify Suzanne Collins not saying anything about them mm -hmm. and it's like I guess the thing too about the blog that Rick Riordan wrote about Palestine, um, he talks about in that blog that children in Palestine and children in Israel wrote him like fan mail. Mm -hmm. And they said that his books made them feel understood. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense why they would, because this is a book series about child soldiers who are in the middle of wars, these children are literally in the middle of wars. Even like as Israeli children definitely are a lot safer than Palestinian children, but they still live in an environment where they are told constantly that they are in danger by a bad evil force that is trying to kill them. Even if that is not true, they are told that and that affects them and how they feel how safe they actually are. And so if Rick Riordan, who is a child based author, got letters like that from people in Palestine and people in Israel, there is no way that Palestinian children did not write similar things to Suzanne Collins. And they deserve to hear something from her. There's no way that a Palestinian child did not read the Hunger Games and feel like this book is about me. And so it makes me feel horrible that people are openly advocating for this author to not have to give them an answer. Like if he had those sort of kids contacting him, she definitely did. Her, her books and movies are, have sold more from Percy Jackson because they're seen as for adults. So people are more likely to read them. And it just, they deserve an answer. There is no reason why a Palestinian or Israeli child or even children from the other countries in the Middle East that also have similar stories as the Hunger Games deserve to be ignored by the author. Like, don't you want to know that the people who wrote things that mean a lot to you care about you? Like, like Rick Riordan today posted on his Instagram and but just to like kind of preface for next time. We're looking at Cersei next time. And yeah, I, Cersei's one of those ones. You gotta love her, you gotta hate her. And I know Rick probably makes her a little bit more on the villainous side, but I mean, it's yeah. Not even, I don't know. It's like, she hates men, but she has like a reason to hate men. That's what I remember about her story is that, yeah, Percy ends up a hamster, which isn't like the best thing that could ever happen to him, but it's also like she has a reason for why she doesn't like men and from what i remember percy is like okay i get why she doesn't like men i don't want to be hamster anymore though but but like there's a at least a reason for why she's like that even if she also is turning him into a rodent. yeah <laughs> and they have to get away from her so that they can keep going um 
there is like a little bit of a middle ground there of like that they do a pretty good job with with most of the villains at this point of yeah they have a reason for being pissed though yeah yeah so i'll we can talk a little bit more about that next week but yeah i do gotta go start dinner so talk to you next week and this was a good one so yeah hopefully we also have more percy jackson news